Hey guys, it's Renee here from thefemininewoman.com and I am super excited because today I have a very special guest with us. Her name is Michaela Bollum and she's going to share with all of us what it really means to be a fully embodied feminine woman. Michaela is an international relationship and intimacy expert who has taught alongside the legendary author and speaker David Data. She runs workshops all over the world for men and women. And a couple of years ago, she published her very first book titled The Wild Woman's Way. Unlock your full potential for pleasure, power and fulfillment, which is an incredible book, by the way. And today we are super lucky because we have Michaela all to ourselves and we are going to sit down and have a chat to her about all things relationships, feminine energy and men. All right, I hope you enjoy this interview. I can promise you there will be many profound insights you wouldn't want to miss. So let's get started now. Okay, so Michaela, thank you very much for being with us today. Well, it's, it's a pleasure, pleasure. Um, and I'm so glad we got to connect. Finally, yes. yes, it's been, I was gonna say actually, I'm not sure if you remember, but the last time I interviewed you was in 2011. <laughs> Wow, yeah. I didn't know it was quite that long, but it was a long time. Yeah. We did schedule it for, I think it was last year. We were going to work. Yeah. <laughs> and then we, we, we were going to schedule it whilst you were in Melbourne. Um, but something fell through. I, yeah. I had on my camera gear. I was going to travel out. But I don't remember exactly <laughs> what happened, but it didn't, it didn't end up happening. What's it yeah. I'm glad we're doing it now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think what happened was, I think it was that time when I got these really, really bad allergies where I could no longer uh, see or or properly talk or anything. It might have been that. I, that something happened, I remember, but that one time when I went to Melbourne, I had such bad allergies, oh I was essentially so, so it was a Melbourne thing. Yes, it's a Melbourne thing. Right. He gets yeah. it too. I get it. Oh, it's, it's, really bad it's not just here. you. Okay, well, it was, it was hideous. I could barely function. So wow. I think that's what happened. Yes, yeah. you did say you were ill. Yeah. It's another good yeah. reason to move out of Melbourne. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Michaela, I actually have your book up here. I just wanted to say thank you so much for writing this book, um, The Wild Woman's Way. I read it, I think, two years ago now, and I absolutely loved it. So oh. thank you so much for, I know it's a lot of energy and effort and time and patience writing a book. And um, I actually wanted to start with reading out a, a couple of um, just small paragraphs from the introduction of your book. So it says, this book is first and foremost my passionate love letter to the body, an invitation for each of us to remember the innate wisdom of our bodies, not our looks or our various shapes and sizes, but the living, feeling body as a portal to unlocking who we truly are. Our bodily genius is a premier decision-making tool, a navigation device extraordinaire, an agent of release and healing, a wisdom carrier of deep insight, and a holder of secrets and mysteries. So, I know that all that is to say that, you know, your book is about rewilding, and a lot of us kind of don't understand and aren't connected to the depth of wisdom in our bodies, um, women or men. And um, yeah, so I would just like to start with asking you, how can women actually rewild themselves? I know, I remember, I think there are four aspects to it or four main steps to rewilding. Well, what is it? To, yeah, to, what, to yeah what is it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's good to start with what is it, because one of the things that I run into over and over is people read The Wild Woman's Way and, uh, and you know, you see it also then used on Facebook and Instagram or whatever, yes. and, it, and it's used as, like, pretty much wild, you know, deranged women's <laughs> and, and, you know, there's always talk about, you know, wow, I was so crazy and I was so wild. That is actually not what rewilding means. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> the wild woman is an archetype and it's an archetype of the part of us and by the way the wild woman you can be a man and have you know and have that archetype load up it's essentially a uh, archetype and as archetypes um, function right they bring the subconscious and areas of the subconscious into awareness and as such it's kind of a collective unconscious and right? human archetypes um, it it brings um, ancient information that sits within all of us to the surface so it can be lived through a body. Mm -hmm. And so the wild woman and rewilding is essentially the coming back to nature. Yes. To nature as in our nature, 
the way we are connected to nature, that could be the rhythms of nature, uh, the moon cycles, our own cycles. And like I said, this is true for men as well, who also uh, are deeply connected to nature as hunters, as trackers, as navigators. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, it's the connecting back to the natural world within and without. And rewilding as a term is essentially a bringing back to its original state. Mm -hmm. No. So that's really what it is about, right? And there is sensitizing, you know, so, so you were asking me what are the steps. There's sensitizing, which is very, very important, actually being able to hear and feel and sense what the, what the body says. There's relaxation. Um, so, so, you know, that's very, very important. There is release, uh, where you let go of, um, you know, kind of old patterns and old contractions, both physically, emotionally, also mentally. And then there's kind of the reclaiming of who we truly are, um, aside from our cultural imprint or our familial demands or things of that nature. So those are some of the things that um, I talk about in the book and in general talk about in my work when it comes to bringing the body back into the fold of um, our, you know, experience because we've gotten so used to just this up here. The go yeah. mode, yeah, the go mode that so many of us are bathed in every day because of our work and habits and yeah. having to be right, you know, but even just going to school growing up, you're taught you have to be right, get everything right and kind of... Yeah, you have to live on someone else's schedule, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's so relevant. Um yeah, for, with regards to sensitizing, um, how can women sensitize? I know you talk a lot about getting back into feeling the pleasure of your body and things like that. Yes, but sensitizing goes a lot deeper, right? So um, let's see how I can describe this easiest for the sake of brevity. <laughs> yeah. So essentially, um, our body continuously uh, sends messages, and so embodiment in, you know, this is another one of those terms that's been thrown around a lot. Yes. Embodiment starts with actually feeling what there is to be felt in the body. And the body always feels things because the body is what kept us alive way longer than our mind has kept us alive. Right? Mm -hmm. Human evolution happened through the body and, and uh, you, you would only survive if your body was highly tuned to the environment, yes. both for hunting and also for survival and uh, mating, you know, living in the wild, all of those kind of things. So to not avail ourselves of the messages our body sends is essentially shutting out a large database from our life. Yeah. And so in resensitizing, we are becoming uh, reacquainted with the messages the body always sends. The more external noise, the more internal, you know, swirling thought, the more irritants and stimulus there is, the less we can hear the more subtle messages of the body. And hence sensitizing gives us access to a database that's much, much bigger than what we can conceive in our minds. Yeah, that's right. And in your book, you also talk about intuition and the gut feeling. And that's all very fascinating to me because I know there's, so many women I've worked with before who either can't get in touch with their gut feeling or they, they can't see the difference between hearing their fears and their anxiety versus a real gut feeling. Yes. So, so what was your journey in discovering, uh, um, trying to think of a better word, in uh, differentiating between, say, a fear response or an anxiety versus the spontaneous knowingness of a gut feeling. Yes. So that kind of intuition, the kind of gut intuition, right? There's also kind of what sometimes people call the third eye intuition, uh, which is kind of a bit being out in the final realms and somewhat disconnected from the body because it's out there. Oh, yeah. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking in the body gut feeling strong bodily um, intelligence yeah. because intuition is nothing else but the intelligence to understand the messages the body sends. Mm -hmm. We all are deeply intuitive, otherwise we would have never survived. Mm -hmm. So essentially what we're looking at is um, 
training ourselves to understand the difference. And so how you do that, and that is certainly how I learned it, is you learn how tense or relaxed your body is when you feel these things. So first you sensitize um, where you come back to listening to the messages of the body. And then you can differentiate between a fear and, let's say, a strong knowing by how tense your body is. Right. Your body is not going to be tense in the strong knowing. There's no reason to be tense. It just arises through the body. While in the fear, there is a clench and there's a contraction and there's a bracing against and pushing away or, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that happens in the body. So how you train for intuition is you have a feeling. And then ideally, as you have the feeling, you feel your body. Is your, feel, your body tense or relaxed? Is your body open or closed? Yeah. Um, does your body, is your body reactive or can it actually receive, right? So that's what you, you work with. And then you see if you can triangulate that which you felt with what is actually happening out there. Mm-hmm. So you have to do kind of a debrief yeah. and go, well, I have this feeling. Okay, it felt like it wasn't connected to a clinch. It just had a really strong feeling. Oh, now I'm finding out this happened. Yeah. Oh, when this happened, my body here, let's say, or here in the gut or somewhere, had a strong sensation, mm-hmm. a strong knowing. And then what you learn over time is you go, I have this sensation. I'm pointing towards my solar plexus. Um, yeah. That means somebody's lying to me. Uh, okay. Right? Yeah. Or, oh, I felt this, you know, like this kind of clinch over my heart. That was um, actual somebody disconnecting from me or, you know, and so on and so on. So you learn uh, signs and signals in the body that point towards certain things happening. And then we call that intuition. But really, it's data points. Right. Okay. It's very interesting. And, I think. It's a good, great distinction, by the way, about the, the, the tenseness. I think intuition, information doesn't just make us tense but sometimes our fears would yeah. go there. Yes, yes. Our fears and also our projections, because sometimes we want things. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that wantingness is also a certain kind of a tension or a reduction yeah. uh, or a push in the body. Yeah. Or exactly, that thing, right? So anytime you feel the, the, you know, these bodily tension patterns, you know it's probably not your intuition, or at least your intuition is... Um, tinged by a fear or by a, a desire right? Yeah, right when you just have uh, information arise it's fairly neutral in the body that, that reminds me actually uh, of this experience that i think most of us can relate to which is um at some point in our lives where you know whether you're going on a trip we you set an alarm for let's say three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning and you wake up right before the yeah, alarm goes off yeah, that's what happens there's, to me there's the no time. fear you literally wake up a minute before the alarm goes off and, I mean, how does that happen? You're, you're not, your body's not trained to wake up at that time. No, no, it just yeah. knows somehow the time. Yeah. And I guess, right. yes. to me, that feels more like an intuitive um, receptivity of the body, knowing you know, that you need to wake up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Rather yeah. than waking up out of fear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and often we don't wake up out of fear, as anybody who's ever set an alarm uh, for, a, for a flight has probably experienced, right? Mm, you can't yeah. oversleep when you're really, really, really freaked out about it, and you've woken up six times during the night and all <laughs> afraid, right? And then when it's time for the alarm, you actually don't wake up, right? So that can happen. Yeah. While your body knows time, of course. Your body is, is suspended in a time grid, so to speak, right? A time direction grid. And, but there's biorhythms, and, you know, there's all kinds of things that the body knows what time it is. Mm. Yes. And so if you just relax enough and you trust that that's happening and you just sleep, you'll wake up, Yeah, you know, like you said, just before the alarm. It's not to say you shouldn't set an alarm. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. We had our, our share of uh, almost missing flights. <laughs> so, so I can definitely see the value of alarms. But it just reminds me of how... There are so many things that I guess we can't explain, but your body sort of feels or knows it already. Maybe we, we're not able to articulate it, but all the, the evidence is out there. Yeah. So I don't know what your stance is on premonitions, Michaela, but how does this all tie into premonitions? Is that something that you've looked into or studied? Well, it's not something I teach per se because my, my uh, work's very much in um, 
you know, present time of and, and being with the body as the body is. But certainly, I would say that premonitions are not uh, as woo-woo as, as you think yeah. they are, yeah. uh, simply because we are hooked into a much larger grid in which things are already happening, you know, yeah. that, that we are aware of. Um, but what I think is very, very important to know is that in a premonition, it can always go the other way because it isn't present moment yet, right? right. So meaning, right, if you feel, let's say, um, well, this morning I had a session with somebody who was supposed to go on a flight that crashed. Um, and a very specific flight, very famous flight that, that crashed and was a, was a new client and um, and... He was telling me about the waking up with the alarm, you know, when mm. for the for the getting to the airport and knowing without a doubt in every part of your of the of his body that he shouldn't go to the airport. Mm. Oh wow. But but a super, super rational, super heady, very high powered um, you know, businessman. Mm. So there was no reason to believe that other than he said it was so compelling and yeah. it was so strong. Oh, wow. oh and then um, he overrode that, mm. right? And he went, um, yeah, well, I got to go. I really, really, <laughs> I, you know, okay, I'm not feeling it, but uh, whatever, you know. And he got up, and three times in a row, things happened within his body that made him go, that's odd. Yeah. Um, you know, and in his body, like where he was just like, oh God, like, yeah. And so then the fourth time on the way out to the airport, he's like, you know what? I'll just take a different flight. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, and that's what saved his life, right? Wow. And so, so the premonition, and, and so the question is, what did he feel? Well, mm. he felt a possible outcome. But clearly, that possible outcome hasn't happened yet, so it can be affected. Right? right? Because some people, of course, say whatever happens, happens, and you can't get out. You could say that, too. You could say he wasn't meant to die, right? Yeah. So he didn't go. You could also say, well, how did he know he was going to die if he wasn't <laughs> meant to die, right? So it's a total mindfuck if you go there. Because every which way you turn it, it's, it doesn't make sense other than to say, we do know uh, of potential danger in our field because that is how human beings have made it into the 21st century. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you're not in tune with potential dangers, however that plays out, right? Because you, you have to kind of, if you really want to feel that and suspend yourself in that big of a consideration, mm -hmm. which is a bit freaky to do, right? You have to feel that it's not as metaphysical as you think because the thing that made the plane crash in that particular case has already had already been set in place yep. by the time he woke up. Right, yeah. Right? So yeah. when he woke up, that thing that made the plane go had already happened. Yep. So... It's, it's not that unusual that you could feel something that's already happened, mm. right? But, of course, it hadn't come to fruition yet, so then it feels like this big woo-woo kind of a thing. And that's not to say there isn't big woo-woo kind of things. There's a lot of things that human beings can explain. But when we look at is it a trainable skill, which is what we're talking about, mm. yeah. right? Because we can philosophize about it uh, endlessly, and I love doing that. But we're talking about... Can intuition and premonition be trained? Mm -hmm. And can you actually sensitize to the messages of your body in a way that is useful? Mm -hmm. Right? And the answer is absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because if you just listen closely, the body constantly picks up all these different strains and pieces of information and data. And mostly that data flows through us and we adjust to our entire circumstance by taking that data in, processing it, and just moving on. We're not aware of it. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I can reach this computer and touch it without having to, in my, in my mind, uh, measure the distance. Like yes. My body knows the distance, 
And it's super easy for me to do that. But of course, if you have a stroke or something happens to your brain, you'll have to relearn that. And the same way we can learn to become super sensitive to the data and make that data part of the way we relate with the world. And then you intuitively, we call that intuition, right? But it's just you have higher data processing. Yes, yes. You you have more data about data, so to speak. Yeah. So when that data comes in, you actually see, actually have processing power for that data. And if you're sensitized to the messages of your body, you get all that information versus being numb to it and it just flowing through without you noticing. Yeah. yeah. I guess a good example there will be uh, something that most people can relate to will be your diet. If you eat junk food all, all your life, you wouldn't be sensitized to how that is affecting your health. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you detox and, and, and start to feel what individual foods do to your body, that's right. Yeah. you have that information, then you can utilize that information to um, make better decisions. Yeah, make yeah. better decisions. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a perfect example, example because, because when you're eating junk food, food you don't food. feel that anything's no. wrong. <laughs> and you get used to it. That, that's the worst thing. You get used to it. And then, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So that sensitization, I guess, is, is very important, especially for a lot of people, a lot of women, uh, or men, men in, um, as well, who've gone through abuse or dysfunctional relationships, uh, terrible upbringing. They don't have that sense of reference and that sensitivity to yes. yeah. process mm-hmm. the information. Exactly. Yes, and furthermore, if you have trauma in your body, your body has a very specific wisdom, which is in fight, flight, or freeze, your rational thought will be overridden for the sake of survival. Mm -hmm. So the moment you're in a triggered state, you know, you're either fight, flight, or freeze, either from an actual in the moment um, happening or from something that triggered a previous memory, you are essentially no longer rational in the Mm -hmm. classic sense, right? You can't go, wait a second. Mm -hmm. Hmm, right? So so that makes it even worse. So for people who are very traumatized, they are by uh, nature numb because it's too painful to feel. Yeah. And then if something gets triggered, that kicks you out of actually um, processing any data because you're now just in survival mode. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Have you dealt with many of these in, in your clients in terms of overcoming abuse or overcoming um, toxic patterns? Mm-hmm. And... and what would your process be to, to help them with that? Yeah, to make them just, I guess, more responsive in the moment and more aware of what's really happening rather than just always reacting. Well, well, there are many questions in there. So, Sorry. yes, I have dealt very, very extensively with uh, people in various states of abuse and trauma. Um, I actually, for a while, uh, was responsible for uh, a large part of treatment in a drug rehab that also had what they call dual diagnosis, so they had um, you know personality disorders and things of that nature. Where there's a lot of um, trauma, you know, I mean, very sometimes very very horrible sexual or physical abuse. Mm. So I've done very extensive uh, work there. Um, on that and I, of course also when you work as closely with people in relationship as I have you know I've done over 30,000 it's a lot more than now but we, we, you know we stopped counting at some point um, one-on-one client hours you do get um, to see every kind of trauma pattern and abuse pattern there is and so some of that is um, let's see how I can say that Some of that requires long-term, very careful um, taking apart of these triggers and patterns and um, help people heal on a very, very deep, substantial level. And that is uh, that is actual therapeutic work. And, um, you know, that's very individualized and that requires, uh, you know, like a very, very kind of razor sharp slicing of people's stuff. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, in the more workshop Uh, general working with people in relationship work, um, the way it's best dealt with is a combination of learning how to feel what the trigger feels like in the body, learning how to release that triggered body from its contraction, and then learning a different way of behaving around that particular trigger. So, um, Very specifically speaking, right, Uh, let's say I'm working with a couple and um, she's had, um, 
let's say, abuse in previous abuse in a previous relationship. So now they're in a wonderful relationship. They're actually really liking each other and loving each other, and he's not abusive. But um, every time he reaches out to her, she flinches, mm-hmm. and then he feels um, rejected, which. I can tell you without a doubt, uh, plays into his childhood wounding because that's how people find each other, right? We always find the reciprocal um, injury, so to speak, right? So now whenever she flinches, he takes it personal. He feels a personal rejection instead of feeling that she's just having a trauma response that actually has nothing to do with him. So now he pulls back. Then she feels like she did wrong or bad, so she's overriding her need for the space, um, and she kind of gives up her own need for the safety of the relationship, forces herself to reach out to him when she's not quite ready, and then 10 years later they hate each other's guts <laughs> because uh, nobody's gotten the thing that they wanted and they have injured themselves and each other, right? Yes. So that's a, that's a classic and that plays out in most relationships. Yes. So how you work with that is that you find the physical... Um, Uh, signs of the trigger Mm. and you train yourself and each other to feel the physical signs before it translates into mind or even full emotion Mm -hmm. just when you feel that thing you know you're triggered and then you move your body in ways that counteracts that particular contraction you you can also you know work with code words and things like that Mm -hmm. and then you have a set behavior that counteracts the behavior that usually occurs so that's it's very specific and i can usually see what it needs and assign that and then have people practice it and then that way uh you still might have to do therapy and you still might have to you know get deep under it but that way you have a tool because of course the problem is you can't wait the 10 years it takes for a pattern to unwind it it will kill your relationship yeah yeah you need to practice and get yeah. those repetitions in in order to rewire a complete exactly behavior. um yeah gosh <laughs> <laughs> um it just reminds me of all the, the times that we've you know, we've talked about abuse you know, with a lot of our clients and whatnot. Yeah. Um, and it is something that they have to address straight away. You don't have, you know, as you said, 10 years or, or the next 20 years to no. untangle all the, the trauma that's been inflicted. That will yeah. cause way too much damage in the process. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, at some point you're just pushing each other's buttons, right? And you trigger each other and there's just no way out of that. And that's then what in a divorce is called irreconcilable differences, right? Right. So, uh, and, and, you know, that's a very sad thing because it's not because anybody wants anything bad for the other person. It's just because in that triggered state, uh, you don't make clear decisions. You're kind of an autopilot. And yeah. that autopilot plays itself out over and over and over. And when you come out of it, you're going, oh, why did I do that again? Well, because it's on autopilot. And yeah. once that button is pushed, the entire pattern unfolds like it always unfolds. Yeah. I feel like the whole world is very much triggered these days. Oh, so, people are so easily triggered by a lot of things. And yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's a very inflammatory <laughs> world that we live in. Yeah, in the current state of the world, yeah, no, we're in our second nine-week lockdown, so <laughs> we have a lot of information coming in about what people are triggered by and this and that, so it's not very stable right now, but, uh, you know. No, but I can tell you from where I'm sitting in California, I wish we had a lockdown, right, oh. because it's not getting any better. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not getting any better. There's no, at least when you have a lockdown, you have an end in sight, right? This is the endless you know, five months in, nothing's changed, and there's no end in sight, and there's there's no, uh, uh, you know, nobody saying, okay, here's what needs to happen. Yeah. It's just, you know, this random, you know, some people take care of themselves, some people don't. Some people think it's all a hoax. Some people are convinced, you know, we're all going to die in the next 24 hours. And it, it's, this, it's, it's hugely polarizing, and you're absolutely right. That is hugely triggering because... It doesn't matter how stable you are and it doesn't matter how uh, stable your upbringing is within the context of what we're talking about, which is the body suspended in a construct that we can orient 
yeah. uh, within, right? And that giving us a sense of safety and give our, uh, giving our nervous system an ability to navigate optimally and all of that, right? When too many of the variables that are the grid in which we live are gone, we are in a permanent state of, um, you know, suspended in fight or flight, essentially. And as everyone knows, um, as we are also experiencing, that leads to fight or flight or freeze behaviors. So then when you look at people, right, from that lens, it makes perfect sense. You have people who are extremely aggressive. That's the fight state, mm -hmm. right? You have people who have essentially checked out yeah. <laughs> your flight state, right? Yes. And then there's the people who pretend like everything's perfectly fine, but they're a little bit off their center. Uh, you know, they barely blink anymore and they're just going <laughs> through the motion. And yeah. they're no longer capable of really feeling anything. Yeah. And that's a large portion of us, including myself at times, right? Where um, I had a whole period a few weeks ago where... I mean, you, you can see it, but I, I'm like totally cut up on my fingers because I constantly cut myself. And I'm really good at chopping vegetables and things like that. I'm really fast and good and I have sharp knives. And, you know, I, I, I don't think I've ever cut myself in, you know, I don't know, 10 years or so. I cut myself, I think, five times in three days. My entire left hand was bandaged at some wow. point. Um, and that tells you something about my state of... Mm. Um, disconnect, yes. right, this embodiment, this association, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, and I knew it, right? I could go, I am clearly disembodied. I'm mm -hmm. clearly yeah. dissociated. Mm -hmm. I'm cutting myself. I barely feel it. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I know I shouldn't. How did this happen? Well, it didn't matter. There was just so much stress in the external world yeah. that my, my being couldn't cope. Yeah. Um, while I thought I was coping fine, which is freeze. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. In freeze, you think you're okay. Now, it doesn't matter that I'm a trauma specialist and a trauma therapist and incredibly astute, and I knew I was in freeze, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But you're still in freeze, and then you have to really, really, really work on getting out of freeze. And now, mind you, I have really good tools nonlinear movement, one of them, you know, and all other kinds of tools. But it still took two or three days to to thaw, so to speak, yeah. out of freeze. And that was all the tools I have. So now imagine somebody who doesn't have those tools and who doesn't even know they are in freeze. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see all the time. Yeah, you know? wow. Yeah, I've personally experienced your nonlinear movement and it is very powerful. Can you share with us a bit about what nonlinear movement is and how it helps your female clients? And also, I'm curious to know, um, do you ever use that with men or is your, um, I know you work with Steve, um, I'm not sure if you both work with, I assume you both work with men, but um, uh, is the approach to embodiment different? No. Oh, okay. The approach to embodiment is not different and nonlinear movement is not gender specific at all. Right. It's nervous system specific, right? Okay. And as far as sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system and polyvagal um, application, you know, in the body, um, there is some differences in the, in, the, in the vagus nerve particularly. There is a bit of a difference. But in the way we work with nonlinear movement, or I should say, uh, to be very precise, it's called the nonlinear movement method. You know, there's other ways that you can move nonlinearly. But I've created something called the nonlinear movement method, and it's specifically designed to unfreeze uh, the body and to bring uh, body, heart, and mind kind of in union again and line it up and align things. It also allows... Um, old trauma and tension and contraction to release. Yes. It's completely non-force, which is super important. Uh, lots of people try pushing their way through trauma or through contraction, and that's very, very detrimental. Yes. It's very non-force. And it can also be used for things like creativity, vitality, pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the pleasure practice, it's a bit different for men than for women, but that's an individual difference, not a taught difference, meaning I facilitate it the same. And we work with both men and women in nonlinear, particularly, there's no, you know, anybody can do it. As long as you have a body, you can do that. Yeah. And um, 
uh, and you know, when we do men's groups or women's groups, in the women's groups, I I lead the charge, and Steve uh, facilitates certain pieces that allow me to actually uh, step in and practice certain things. And in the men's groups, he will take the lead, but I will also add things like nonlinear movement and certain things that have to do with how women see men, and you know, and also my expertise on energy systems in the body. So we do everything, you know, and we work with couples and individuals and groups and the whole thing. So there's not really a difference, except that, um, let's see how I can say this, that when you work with a woman and a woman's body, uh, the, there's certain ways that you can uh, make or, or create safety are a bit different than when you work with just men's bodies and what creates safety. Uh, but those are very, very, very fine differences mm -hmm. that really have to do with containment and they have to do with um, how you set up a room, um, how you speak, right? Because um, processing is a bit different, uh, you know, in, in a male brain versus a female brain because of biochemistry and hormones and stuff like that. So those are super, super subtle differences. Um, but that's very, very specialized. In a group setting, we'll just teach it to whoever wants uh, to work with their body. Yeah. Yeah, right. So how can, how can a woman work with nonlinear movement by herself in her own home? I know you recommend practices with music, at like beginning with, was it one song you recommend, just one to begin with? One song a day, yes. Yeah. It's always important to do less than one wants to do. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's very, very important because that uh, ensures that you can actually do it. My teacher used to say the, the best practice yeah. is the practice you do. do yeah. And that's always true, right? So you might have great ambitious plans for an hour a day of practice. <laughs> uh, you're probably not going to no. do that more than once. And then you'll fall off. And then you have negative associations yes. with practice, which mm -hmm. makes it harder the next time around, and so on and so on. So one song a day, pick a song, any song, ideally one without lyrics, yeah. so that you're not getting in your head about the lyrics or singing along. So, you know, tribal drumming or stuff like that, world music, you know, like something that, that has rhythm but that doesn't have lyrics, ideally no pop songs because that gets very old very quickly. Yeah. Um, so you pick a song a day. And then you start with what I call moving what you're feeling practice. And so moving what you're feeling practice is essentially you stand, you close your eyes, you feel what's happening. So and that could be something like, like for instance, if I do that right now, moving what I'm feeling, my right hip feels a bit off. So I'd be just moving my right hip, but I'm not moving to release necessarily. I'm just moving that sensation in the hip, right? And as I do that, then I can feel it radiates up here into my right shoulder and then I can start moving my right shoulder and when I do that there's actually an emotional component to it. When I move my right shoulder something in my solar plexus feels unsettled so then I can just move as that unsettledness and so I track sensation, I track emotion, I track thoughts. You can move as a thought. Mm -hmm. If you feel numb, you move as numbness. Mm -hmm. right? You feel tired, you move as fatigue. So you don't uh, do anything other than tracking what's actually happening. And that's hugely sensitizing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's hugely embodying. It also relaxes your body. It washes out old things. So there's incredible benefits to it. And it's really, really quick. And it's a little bit like flossing. Right? <laughs> yeah. just, just do it every day. It flosses your system of any remnants and stuff that you, you know, that doesn't need to be there. And then when you have time, and inclination, you can just do a longer set of that. Yeah. And nonlinear is mostly done on hands and knees because it gives you access to all the areas of the body. But when moving what you're feeling, you can start standing because that's also really useful when you are out and about. When something starts feeling a bit locked up, you can just move your body subtly while standing. I do it a lot in airplanes and on, in airports. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, because then it, it, you train yourself to just move stuff through the body. Yeah. And one of the, um, the real joys of the pandemic, there is such thing, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> is uh, out of pure necessity, I started teaching nonlinear online. Yeah. And I've actually realized that it works really, really great because I get to instruct people in their own homes yeah. and it makes for an easier home practice. Oh, okay. 
Gotcha. Yeah, yes. okay. which, is, which has been really, really, really lovely. Um, so I do two every two weeks, one for Australia and one for Europe, and both of them work for the US. So, you know, I do one in the morning, one in the evening. And so I've gotten an enormous amount of men and women. It's mostly women coming to classes, as usual. But, um, you know, also some men. I've gotten a lot of people turned on to nonlinear movement method because I can... You know, I can teach people at home, and yeah. that's been really, really good and rewarding. Yeah, I can imagine. That's great to hear. And they can continue that practice because they've practiced in they've that done setting. It. Yeah, yeah. They don't have to. Yeah, have that now problem. have a positive association with your practice space in your own home, which makes it, of course, much easier to practice by yourself. Yes. So. Uh, you know, with all the, the horrors of no longer being able to travel, which is rough for me yeah. personally, right, and, and missing the in-person contact, this has been one of the real blessings that I got to and, and will continue to actually teach people in their own home, and that's been quite rewarding. Nice. <laughs> yeah. That's good to hear, Michaela. There's actually one thing I've been wanting to ask you. It was about um, the archetypes. You mentioned it in your book uh, that there was... One particular archetype, a Hindu goddess, I think her name was Kali, you said you first, em, not embodied her, but yes, you embodied that archetype because her power came from um, destruction and I can't remember what else it was, but she, would, she had an instantaneous response to circumstances instead of being angry or having a crazed frenzy. And the reason I want to ask about this is because I know that a lot of women would love to have that authentic responsiveness and love to get to that place. However, it, it, I think it's not so easy when so many of us have uh, so much pent up hurt and anger, resentment that hasn't been processed, no one's helped us process it. Um, or even if we try it, we wouldn't know how. So how, how does one, two questions, how does one get to that instantaneous responsiveness, one, and two, um, can you not have an instantaneous response of anger? Like for me, when I think about like primary emotion, for example, there is such a thing as primary a primary emotional response of anger in the moment. So, yeah. So, yes. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, there's so much in there. Well, I think the first thing to be said is that you know Kali has become kind of a trope. Oh, I showed you my Kali. Oh, really? Then you probably <laughs> just spewed all your old anger and unresolved resentment yeah. over your poor partner, right? Mm. That's not the same. Um, as I'm saying in the book, Kali is the archetype of both re destruction and rebirth, and yeah. it comes through love, right? It's yeah. not tolerating anything less than. Um, what has to happen, right? And so spontaneous anger doesn't have residue. Yeah. It comes, it goes, it's done. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's um, this is, by the way, also true with spontaneous anything, right? Spontaneous yeah. sadness doesn't have residue. It comes, it goes, it's done. Mm. But for that to happen, for any spontaneous emotion, this is also true for, for true pleasure and you know, all kinds of joy, um, you have to be able to be fluid in the experience of your emotions. And so strong emotions usually and strong sensations in the body that come with it are usually clenched down upon. Right. Right. So we feel something and then we go, oh, no, you know, can't yeah. feel that. <laughs> not today. <laughs> not today. Read something. <laughs> Too painful, not appropriate, whatever. Right. Yes. So yeah. we clench down. Every time we clench down, it's like a sediment. Yeah. And it just, you know, layers and layers and layers and layers. And then you decide to let it out. And what comes out is not a reaction to the actual thing that's no, happening. But that's right. 10 yeah. years of, of just, you know, <laughs> pent up stuff in mm. there. And then, of course, what happens next is the person on whom you unleash this swamp is going to go, whoa, you are way out of line. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right, and so then you have to suppress again, and then that sets you up for the next set of yeah. swamp, and so to speak. Yeah. So the important piece, and this once again brings us to uh, sensitizing into nonlinear movement and things like that. So in nonlinear movement, there's a whole segment that's release, where you release things. You don't even need to know what they are. You just let the tensions and the contractions and all of that loosen and then the body gets this intelligence of actually washing things out mm -hmm. you might even have visuals or flashbacks or whatever but you just go right. with it and you go with it and we go with it eventually your well runs clear yeah right at that moment 
when something angers you, the anger arises not attached to the sediment. Mm. Mm. It comes up, it does its thing, it leaves. Yes. And you're not going to be pissed for three days after because it just came and went, right? Yeah, yeah. The same way that joy comes and goes, same way that sadness comes and goes. Yeah. And then at that point, you're authentically, in the true sense of the word, uh, authentically expressing what happens in the present moment, with, of course, the caveat that you are able, because you're not so gripped by old shit, mm -hmm. to modulate your expression to what's needed. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, right? right. Like, for instance, if you get angry at your child, mm. you're not going to unleash, you <laughs> know, yeah. at, at full force, but you might feel the thing and and go, no, right, because yeah. something they're about to hurt themselves, and then it leaves. Yeah. And then, you know, the next emotion, which is probably relief that nothing happens mm. or yeah. love because you care for them so much or whatever happens, and then you bring that up and you don't let anything get clenched, mm. and then... Um, you can, you know, really, really artfully fine-tune how you express. Mm. But you know what you're expressing and you know the difference between old crap and present moment expression. Yeah. This is also very good when it comes to pleasure. Yeah. But, yeah. Of course. So um, you can work with it by releasing old stuff in the body if you need to go see a therapist because there's still some unresolved stuff or you don't understand things. Very good to do. Somatic, ex somatic experiencing is a great modality as well for trauma-related, um, you know, releasing that has to still happen cognitively. But usually the moment you understand it, um, you know, you have to work with the body because you can understand it all you want in the mind. The body needs to be released of that contraction or it will re-manifest and re in state itself over and over and over. Mm. So when we come to Kali, uh, it's a very misunderstood um, archetype because in that is total love, right? It's not destruction for the sake yeah. of destruction because you're hurting. It's the natural reaction to something horrible happened in the moment. And it's kind of an interesting thing when anger rises without the old stuff, it's almost all bodily, Right. has very little emotional content. It's just this pressure that rises and comes up, right? And then you you usually, you know, this is why people punch and stuff like that. You don't want to yeah. do that ever, right? No. But the, it's the feeling no, because there's no reason ever to physically, you know, abuse somebody. No reason yeah. Yeah, whatsoever. Exactly. Yeah. I want to say that very clearly because that unfortunately comes with that particular trope as well yeah. where women are allowed to beat on their men That's and right. men are yeah. supposed to take it. That That's is right. abuse people yes. and for training your man's nervous system to become numb to you. Mm, right. well, whoever so started this shit uh, knew nothing about trauma because when you, when you force a man to breathe in the storm of a woman, right? what you're saying is numb yourself, buddy. Just right. suck it up. Breathe it down. I guess you know, they have no uh, choice. That's the natural response. Well, of course. Yeah. And also, why would anybody be as idiotic as to stand uh, <laughs> in, the, in the face of abuse? You've yeah. got to step away yeah. and people have to deal with their shit, right? Yeah. And deal with their shit appropriately. So that all said, um, there's no reason ever to, to, to lash out. But the feeling is one of wanting to bring it out. Mm -hmm. And when that rises and you feel that, then it's a good thing to keep the body moving so it can move through and bring the appropriate response, which is probably something like not this, but this. Yeah. Right? No. Mm. Right? Because usually anger comes from having to set a boundary. Right. Yes. Right? And that's the next thing. You're angry and your anger results in you having to protect. And what, what does that usually mean? Boundary setting. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. I don't like this. I don't want this. This mm -hmm. isn't good for me. Mm -hmm. you know? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we have two sons and, you know, I can remember a couple of recent situations in which, for example, our oldest son was cutting a mushroom right on his finger. And David, oh, yeah. David's not an angry person whatsoever. Or, I mean, <laughs> it was both of us. One minute it was like, Tyson, no! And he's like, no! And we both, you know, it was just, but once it was done, it was done. And yeah. at, looking back, the anger serves the purpose of him getting the seriousness of yeah. not chopping a mushroom like that. Right. And that's born out of love. Yes. 
It's not born out of no, malice, right? it's no, born out of love, love right? Yeah. And, and that's the thing, right? If you express anger born out of love, mm. it comes, it goes, and the next thing that happens is the love that's mm. in the anger gets freed. And then you hug your child or you say, don't do that, you're going to hurt yourself, yeah. you know? And, and, uh, and then everybody moves on and it's not abusive. And they feel the intent as they well. They do, they do. It, you can see it in their eyes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. They know. <laughs> and they still yeah. get the message of, oh, I, I, I shouldn't do that again ever because yeah. it is so serious. And, and this is yeah. key too to know that I think it's important for women to know that anger is important. But we're talking about authentic, spontaneous anger, not yeah. the uh, vile anger that a lot of women sometimes associate with being a strong woman. Like... Yeah, yeah, but a strong woman, you know what a really strong woman is? You, you can, can set a boundary. boundary. That's yeah. a strong woman. Yeah, exactly. Right? I mean, it's as simple as that. You are angry about something, it's probably because you're being transgressed upon. Set a boundary. Yeah. Once yeah. you set a boundary, you don't need to be angry anymore because you're not being transgressed upon. Nobody's messing with you. Mm -hmm. So what is the sign of a strong woman is the ability to set proper, appropriate boundaries. And this brings us back to the very beginning. How do you know that you need to set a boundary? You can feel it in your body. There's nothing worse when somebody smiles nicely in a meeting and then, you know, 30 minutes later, they suddenly realize that that wasn't okay and they yeah. missed the opportunity yeah. because they're so not in touch with the messages of the body yeah. that they couldn't feel that ouch or no till 30 minutes later and now they're out of the meeting and now they're really really angry <laughs> and they can't yeah. Yeah. fix it anymore right mm -hmm. and then resentment builds and i have to go back and say well this didn't work for me or whatever so when when you're really sensitized to the messages of your body the no is immediate and you can set the boundary appropriately and the quicker the more immediate the boundary setting the quicker the whole thing can pass mm -hmm. and then there is no real reason to hold on to any anger because you don't have to feel that resentment and the seething, you know, yeah. just like madness yes. uh, when you've set a boundary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because that's all, who does he think he, he is? And how could he do that? And all of that, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, not if you, if you go, I don't like that. Yeah. That's the end of that. Yeah. yeah. And you don't have to think yeah. about it then. Yeah. <laughs> right. So... Um, I don't know. Are you on a time restraint, Michaela? I just had a few questions. I am. I actually have a client session that was supposed to start seven minutes ago. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so, and also, as you can hear, my dogs have come, gone completely ape shit. Okay. Um, hold on. Let me just text him. All right. Um, okay. Yeah. So yes. So that brings us to an end. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Part two. That's uh, that's possible, you know. Yeah. But yeah, I gotta um, gotta go and deal with this. Yeah. Sure. Okay. No problem. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. I mean, obviously, we can chat all day. There's so much to talk about as well. Of course. An hour is just so short. Yeah. But thank you so much for sharing. And um, if people want to find out more about your workshops, yes. where do they go? MichaelaBorm.com. That's correct, yeah, and I'm assuming you'll post that in the show notes, and that's yeah. where you can find absolutely everything. Lots of free content, um, because we did a whole bunch of support for people during the pandemic, so there's, um, you know, like free meditations, there's some free movement stuff, there's lectures that are on the podcast that are free, and then, you know, there's nonlinear movement sessions, there's a nonlinear teacher training online, and we're going to start doing a couple stuff online as well, while we're still all... Some of lockdown, so yeah, lots happening. Wild Women's Way online course for people who, you know, um, this is specifically for women, you know, um, want to really get into their body with all the things that come with a female energy system. And then we have Awakening the Pleasure Body, which is for men and women alike. So there's lots happening. Fantastic. Awesome. Good to know. Fantastic. Yeah. Anyhow, yeah. thank you thank so much for your time. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank uh -huh. you. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>